Mary's mo most entertaining thesis presentation to date, like burning down the house style. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to help making that joke, but okay. Um, quickly, a few announcements. Uh, please join us after uh, at MFA alum Emily Benton's home uh, for ton after tonight's reading, where there'll be celebratory nosh and brewskis. Uh, you can find the dancing feet around the corner at 320 South Menden Hall, starting at 8:30 p.m. tonight. And let us not forget. More poetry, more fiction. Next Friday, February 24th, uh, the ever cool Ellie Bookman and always funny John Williams will be reading right here at St. Mary's House at 7 o'clock. So, no need for an RSVP, just show up and blast, uh, bask in their literary glory. With that out of the way, tonight I have the privilege of introducing my friend Sean Delgado, who you might have already noticed also moonlights as the running program's entire AV department. He's usually right behind that camera over there. Uh, thankfully, tonight we have the opportunity to share in Sean's presence, no longer behind the camera, but rather on the stage, as it were. If you have attended more than one MFA party here, uh, you've likely seen Sean break into dance. In the kitchen, in a hallway, on a front porch, the man's got moves. And the same unstoppable energy Sean channels in music guides his written work. Sean's poems demand your attention. Rhythmic and shrewd in diction, sweeping and unapologetic in conceit. Sean's poetry never lingers long, preferring instead to lift your feet at each line break and tempt you forward with a combustion of imagery and rhetoric all his own. I remember reading Sean's poem about Stalin in our first year workshop, thinking to myself, this poem is just begging to be read aloud. The speaker seems to wrestle right off the page. And when Sean read it for us in class, I realized every poem should be like this, unnerving in the way the margins aren't ever wide enough, effervescent in the pursuit of articulation. Each of Sean's poems shakes something loose, deliberate and unflinching. So, ladies and gentlemen, loosen your grip. And please join me in welcoming from Atlanta, Georgia, Standing six feet, one and a half inches tall, weighing in at 177 pounds, you shall know that. Terry, Kennedy, mm -hmm. you really help hold the program together, and I think it's a really rare opportunity that a program is run by two former alums who really know what the program is supposed to be at its heart, so I'm really fortunate for that. Uh, thank you to Stuart. Um, at times when I wasn't really in the best place in Atlanta, I thought, I could be in Greensboro studying with Stuart, and I did, and I'm really glad I did. So thank you for advising my thesis and your help. Uh, thanks to David and Rebecca for the tutorials and their feedback on my individual poems. Um, I thank them for the structure I'm getting from both of them, from their classes. Uh, thanks to Michael Parker for his structure class, because I always thought that it was a joke when people said fiction writers were just failed poets, and from his attention to detail, that's absolutely the case. <laughs> <laughs> They're just the same. 
say it was great. <laughs> um, thanks to uh, all the students in the class before me, my class especially, and the first years now. Just the more perspectives on poetry I see, the more ways I realize there are to do it. And just I get more options learning from you. Um, thanks to my former teachers, which are really too many to name here. And the same with some of my Atlanta friends who really helped form the foundation. One former teacher I'd like to really mention is Thomas Lux and the Poetry at Tech group of Ginger Murchison and Travis Denton. I was at a technical school with no idea I wanted to write, and I found writing there somehow, in a school with no English department. So I especially have to thank them. Um, thanks to my parents. I, at times I don't know what you really think about this, but I do know that you're always behind me. And that, that means a tremendous amount. And then, on top of thanking everyone who's here to come support me at the reading. I have to step back for a minute and think of all the people I don't know I have to thank. Because I, I didn't have any classes with Holly and Craig, but from all the things I've heard from my fellow students, I'm sure I've gotten echoes of what you've taught them. So there's, there have to be limitless numbers of people that I don't know I need to thank, that have somehow gotten me to where I am. And with that, I guess we'll begin some poems. And I will start at the beginning of the universe. This is before the bang. In the beginning, our bodies were so whole, it was holy. Unformed energy held in a ball smaller than any sun. Yet all the suns were there, with every sun of the reptiles and all the dancing daughters of water and light, small enough to be emptiness. Our center held each worm and root, every quasar, every skyscraper, every rock. All pets, past and present, rested nearby the lost keys, even one still not yet lost. All was potential as the universe churned in its womb. The angelfish were years from being angelfish, and metal elements hadn't been invented needing to sort out their arrangements. My hands had to live countless lives in darkness, in caves and fields, in castles and cities, wringing their atoms for eons as they waited to become hands. There's still a set of borrowed tools. I inherit and lose flecks of each fingertip if I stroke a piano's note, greet a stranger, sit from a mug. I shuffle and deal myself to unknowns that might include a hundred thousand stones. But I wonder about that first sacrifice when the everything gave itself up to make us. If that's not a sign of God, it still proves to me that if each man can be grander than a singularity, the world exists by a magic so large that even as an accident, it would still be divine, still some kind of love. This next poem, one of the title of it, is a phrase in Spanish, which literally translates to until always, but I guess we'll get there in the poem. This is hasta siempre. English and I are best pals. He often completes my sentences before I know what I think. But hearing the Spanish phrase sail through the cacophony of sidewalk vendors on a summer afternoon, makes me feel more Cuban, shakes a drowsy lineage inside me, buried under a blanket of hamburgers and 24-hour cable that sometimes runs out of programs, but never out of things to sell. Hasta siempre, until always, reads as a better expression of forever. Forever feels distant, the way space stretches endless and sparse with stars that dwarf my rambling experience with their combustion of basic elements. Stars remind me that this planet is tethered to a ball of burning gas, not too hot or cold, not too close or far, the galactic devouring of luck at Earth's inception. For the stars, Forever lasts until a time beyond us, but not eternally, as they burn out and implode. Hasta siempre 
is my desire. Prayer condensed to two words. The phrase opens with the ahs of epiphany. It tells me, see, yes, to begin the next word. And whole, it says, please make this moment linger. Not until some gassy giant blows its engine. Instead, infuse this feeling in the world. Oil soaked into the dark fabric of the universe, leaving a supernova-hued stain. I offer it up. A summons. Hasta siempre. Amen. And now we'll come back to Earth. This is poem as a gateway drug. I remember my days using back in high school, avoiding eye contact as I rushed upstairs with a chapbook stowed in my coat. My bedroom door locked, I tear into the package, eating pages so fast my vision would blur when the work unhinged a valve in my head. An electric tremble would hit my hands and feet, push my arms and legs into a stretch. I smashed my first car into another's bumper at a red light while inhaling lines of verse. I stashed the book under a seat as I talked to the cops. I tiptoe around my habit when meeting new folks. I find that I get a crushed face, no vex, from most when I offer up a greatest hit. It's my secret how much I pay for these tiny bags of books. The high school teachers talked about poetry like it was sex ed, enveloped in mystery and danger. Instead of diseased penises projected on a pull-down screen, we were taught tales of heartbreak, obscurity, never of the pleasure it could release. They squeamishly offered the wrong techniques, squeezed the poem so hard it would turn blue and wilt, cut off from its supply of blood. When a guy standing in a concert side lot opens his hand to reveal a couple confetti squares tucked in tin foil, I'm ready to experiment. I've rolled whole tomes across my tongue. So what could these wordless scraps do? Go ahead, I tell him. Drop some in my mouth. Slide one into my ear. It only will dry the last few days. <laughs> this might have been someone else's experience, but... And sometimes, as you stand at the microphone, an ambulance passes. And the howl scares the grackles from their lamppost perches. It tramples the crowd's murmur as the siren moans urgent again and again through the cool September air, louder than any rescue you've ever known. You lock your speech below your voice box as if to shield it from lemon-sized hail. The people sitting at wrought iron tables turn their backs to you to better hear the pitch climb during the approach than die the instant the truck streaks past. Its automobile breeze slaps their hats to the floor and shakes all you've said from their anxious brains. What should you do when, the, when their attention staggers back to the stage and the silence returns? What to do as the minds resettle like a snow globe tossed into a snowbank? Begin at the beginning. Louder. Oh, this might be the first time I've ever read this poem out loud to an audience. Chemistry. I dislike cold. I'll never be cool. My best self must be hot. How can I achieve this state? I will use the ideal gas laws. 
I should explain my thoughts at this point. Far past death, men exist like a vapor. I am a container of uniform size. To observe a positive change in temperature, the simple solution is to increase the pressure. As long as the container holds together, I'll be great. <laughs> Poem was titled, uh, She told me she would cry for no reason. As if she thought each tear was an immigrant with no homeland, no cause. Instead, I want her to blame the phone, voiceless, for two weeks. Maybe tell me about an eyeless statue, its face rain <coughs> erased. Or teach me that in every flash flood, the blind worms drown first. She could say it's rush hour clamor riding the walls or midnight silence. Let me know about teen shoplifters leaving with candy stuffed pockets or with hands cuffed. Do traffic lights splash red accusations into her bedroom? I'd listen if her oldest cat died. Now the other 12 won't eat. Say the bacon has green fringe and the milk has soured. Share a dream where she was a dog abandoned in the woods. Show me the shipped gift the mail returned. Or share how the part of her first kiss is now a gas station. Let me see the flood warped cello, untunable forever. I'd accept words describing the sun as a Crete-sized island. All grass is gray, a depiction of tomorrow as an empty vase on a fence. And now we are done with the bummer. <laughs> <laughs> is of sweat and distance. When I can feel the heat's weight, I stay sweating, as if this will prove that I work if not on an assembly line cutting steel, or pushing a cart of hot dogs down the sidewalk, or a broom through an empty elementary school, then at least it being alive. My first choice for cool is the breeze, not the AC. And if a trek's ahead, up to 40 furlongs, I choose my own engine, cooled by the beads of brine on my skin and the wind singing in my face as I pedal through traffic. I've not been pickled by the saline crystals that barely glint in noontime light. When I encounter acquaintances buying groceries or a cup of coffee, I avoid the handshake, apologize through and for my sweating, say hey and answer questions. I lean toward the polite, though as a body might. I prefer to wrap someone in the wave of my embrace, submerge an ally in the sea spray that fights to be free from my internal ocean. I need to believe that breed of people exists, even if a little rough. And when I meet one, I might view my life as a series of tides, receding now, but rising in the future that will become past. My moisture will leave a patch of dark wetness, the kind that allows fallow ground to grow thickened and full, without a mind for tainted or grime, so lush you can't see the filth. The home stretch, two more. This one is I actually got a package once that was wrapped in a map, and it just felt like, wow, I got a poem immediately. Great. <laughs> a box wrapped in a map. It arrives in the mail with highway snakes red and blue across the thick paper folds, addressed to me, but from an unrecognized source. I pry the edges with a dull knife, toss away scraps of Philadelphia. Savannah, Charleston, and Quebec, 
rip the mountains apart. Deeper, I find Phoenix, Pike's Peak. My fingers brush the symbols of bustle as I tear the streets and city grids away, struggle with the tough, striated tape. Layer after layer yields, and some serum wakes my blood as I near the cardboard heart. I forget old news about death traps in packages or poisons lining envelopes. I don't know where I'm headed, but it looks like a ticket. I'm ready. Take me away. Mm -hmm. Before this last poem, I, I've, I've heard that somebody from our class had posted that we are on, I don't know, on Facebook or something, we are the best MFA class ever. And I was just going over all the people who've been here. I mean, there's Jim and Terry, obviously, but there's people who won Pulitzer Prizes, like Claudia Emerson, there's Juliana Baggett, Rodney Jones, Jillian Bisa, George Singleton, Steve Almond and Lynn Barrett, Kelly Link and Kelly Cherry. There's Sarah Lindsay, Julie Brooks Barber, all these names, Camille Dungy, Drew Perry, Allison Sia, and maybe we can be the best ever. And to finish up, uh, a lot of my, my peers here know that I'm a pretty big fan of professional wrestling. Yeah. And for, <laughs> for better or for worse, I've uh, decided to title my thesis, Do Not Try This at Home. <laughs> and this poem is, Do Not Try This at Home. <laughs> Pile drivers, moon salts, the Indian death lock. Flying clotheslines, inverted atomic drops, and the shooting star press. The cobra clutch, figure four leg lock, the power bomb. Irish whips, monkey flips, snapmares, stunners, neck breakers. Sound nasty? They are. Impossible? For us. But cross the ocean to Tokyo or take a train to Mexico. In Moscow and Manhattan, the millions and millions <laughs> ache waiting for a decision. Pinfall or submission, or a screw job played right. Show us a code breaker, a lion tamer, a backstabber, the mandible claw, a human, a human suplex machine, and a pump handle slam. Get the tables and chair shots, the wrist locks and chest chops, but only if you know you're stone cold or an apex predator. You better be a cerebral assassin or the ultimate opportunist, the people's champion or the American dream, daddy. Because it takes a dragon to stagger standing after a DDT. Repay it with a slam. If you aren't the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be, take off your mask and tights and go home. I wouldn't even think about it. That floating moment above your foe, sandwiched between canvas and spotlight, you are not of them. And not because your, bicep, your biceps are not 22-inch pythons. Not because you have never been called the personification of domination. <laughs> you are simply not tough enough. Take one backdrop to find out. Now think 30. I learned last winter, dropped a high elbow to the gut of my cousin after he slipped in the ice outside a bar. For weeks my mistake not or not, for weeks my mistake mocked each moment. In the ring, even the victor suffers. And to be great, you better sell every bump, every spot. Prove tonight's rival can test your limits. How much desire would you need to flip 15 feet off a ladder onto a flimsy table? How do you feel about thumbtacks? <laughs> about blading your forehead to let the juice flow into a crimson mask? How about sandpaper? What would you say into a microphone to make it a pipe bomb? If you broke your back in a non-title match, would you try to return? Would the rules matter then, or would you be ready to cheat to win? Live for the fireworks and the fans. 
but too many have died in the pursuit. Their goal is so much bigger than a distracted ref. It matters more than an illegal hold or a handful of tights or a manager's hand snaking below the ropes. Underhanded? Yes, but up front. You've been warned. And I know why crowds chant, Foley is God, because I bow down to the hardcore legend who earned every chance. He jerked the curtain and saw a ceiling in bingo halls and high schools. Did the J-O-B in front of turnout so small, they make bomb scares look busy. And went to the hospital the way some people hit the bar after work. Except he didn't get a cold beer. He got stitches. Over 300 if we're counting. And we are because he was not unbreakable, except for his will. His ear ripped off, second degree burns in a C4 match, his four front teeth knocked out, six broken ribs, a torn ACL, a torn abdominal, a broken jaw, two broken noses, a dislocated shoulder, a separated shoulder, a fractured shoulder, a broken wrist, bone chips in his elbow, eight, documented concussions, <laughs> and thousands of thumbtacks in his skin couldn't make him quit before becoming Cactus Jack, Dude Love, and Mankind, and the World Heavyweight Champion. Bang, bang! <laughs> Call that fake. I dare you. I want to be called Phenom or Showstopper. Call me the Heartbreak Kid, Mr. Perfect, the Nature Boy. I want a ticket to take my act from Manchester to Panama. I want to hear the crowd pop when I rip off my shirt. Woo! Would already be in the dictionary if they knew how many O's it took. I want to be styling and profiled until the day I die. Want to be a rated R superstar. Show y'all what R A S S L I N wrestling is all about. I want to be a kiss-stealing, wheeling-dealing, limousine-riding, jet-flying, son of a gun on the road 300 days a year. I want to be a road warrior. I want to hoist the gold, because to be the man, you've got to beat the man. I want to be the best in the world at what I do. Give me a signature move, a finisher to make my problems go to sleep. So I can pin the world down for the one, two, three.